Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle, and today we're gonna take a trip down memory lane and relive one of the craziest stories that I can remember in recent movie news history, and that is Movie Pass. This week, Max dropped a new documentary called Movie Pass, Movie Crash about the rise and fall of Movie Pass. And a lot of people asked me if I was going to watch it and even asked me if they had contacted me to do an interview for it because Movie Pass was a story that we covered extensively back when I was at Screen Junkies. And it was also a story that I briefly and unexpectedly had an actual personal involvement in. And I liked the Movie Pass documentary that Max released. I think that it was a good look at the rise and fall of it on the business side. And it especially had a lot to say about the fact that this was a company that was founded by two black creators who then had their company essentially hijacked by two white guys who came in with private equity money and ran it into the ground. And I think that that's an important aspect of the story. But one thing that I was disappointed in, and I get it because it was so focused on the business side of things, was that the documentary really really didn't get across how utterly insane it was to watch movie pass happen in real time. It was like watching a slow motion car crash where the person driving the car is looking at you saying like, what are you talking about? The road's clear, we're doing just fine. It was a story that at times made you feel like you were losing your mind because Mitch Lowe and Ted Farnsworth, but particularly Mitch Lowe, who in many ways was the voice of MoviePass, was so good at just trying to convince you that they had everything figured out all the way up until the end. So while I think Movie Pass Movie Crash is a great look at the business side of things, I wanted to put together a little retrospective on my own and this happened to also coincide with the daily shows that we were doing over at Screen Junkies News, which later became Fandom Entertainment. And we covered this over the course of about a year, maybe a little bit longer than a year. So there was an extensive archive for me to go back and pull from to see what we were doing and what we were saying in real time as things were happening. So let's talk about Movie Pass from the very beginning. And I want to kind of fill in that middle part that the Max documentary doesn't talk about, which was the utter insanity of the MoviePass phenomenon. When MoviePass launched its new pricing back in 2017, it was a massive story because of its simplicity. Any movie, any theater, any day. Some of that was never true, by the way. You could never go to any theater using MoviePass. It blocked out some premium theaters in Los Angeles, like Arclight Cinemas. And over time, most of that became untrue. But even with the restrictions that existed when it launched, it still seemed like something that was just an impossible deal. It was too good to be true. And it's something that I discussed alongside Roth Cornet the day that Movie Pass was announced. Nine ninety five per month. Yeah. Nine ninety five per month. See one movie per day. Yes. In the theater, for ten dollars a month. Exactly. Which so sounds. Amazing. Like it's too good to be true. Doesn't that sound amazing? So right off the bat, this seemed like an objectively insane story because you have a company here that's encouraging millions of people to sign up for a service that is blatantly, mathematically a money loser for anybody that goes to more than one movie a month. And I think what a lot of people forget is that from day one, MoviePass was at war with the biggest theater chain in the US, AMC. AMC never trusted MoviePass. They said that they were setting an impossible standard that no theater could meet, and they were right, by the way. So this is what AMC is worried about. This is MoviePass is going about. to destabilize the whole thing and be such a good deal that in their mind, it's when it inevitably fails, that people are going to turn on the theater chains and say, why aren't you that cheap? And they can't match the that movie price. Going. They can never match that price. Because they're right. It's not a sustainable yeah. business model. It is not. Is it a better business model? It's not a better business model, no. but it could really cause some sea change in the industry. Now there's a Mandela effect that's going on because I've had people say, hey, I remember that interview that you did with Mitch Lowe, the CEO of MoviePass, and I actually didn't do that interview. I forget where I was that day, but Roth Cornett did the interview alongside Billy Patterson, and it's actually a great video. I watched the whole thing prepping for this video, and, and the interview was solid. They asked him some tough questions, but the thing about Mitch Lowe was that he was so, I don't know if it was lying, optimism, delusion. In the old days, he used to raise $100 million and then spend it and grow the business. The way we're doing it is we're just losing tens of millions of dollars every month while we build this business and eventually we get to profitability. Over time, we're gonna get enough people who don't go 
so crazy that they offset the the heavy moviegoers. And the crazy thing about watching that interview with Mitch Lowe, or really any interview with Mitch Lowe, is that he was able to explain their plans for making money, which were totally unrealistic in a completely rational way. We want the theater to make more money, and we want a small part of the extra profit. You are going to make more money uh, with MoviePass even after giving us 20% of concessions and a discount on tickets. This is one thing that wasn't addressed at all in the documentary on Max, which was that their stated business goal was indeed to offer an impossible deal and then basically to shake down theaters for a share of those profits. I mean, that's crazy. Their road to making money was essentially extortion. And it was a plan that AMC said many times over they would have absolutely nothing to do with. AMC, quote, this is last year, AMC, quote, has absolutely no intention, I repeat, no intention of sharing any, and I repeat any, of our admissions revenue or our concessions revenue with MoviePass. But MoviePass wants it. They want $3 cut on AMC tickets and 20% of the concessions, and they have made similar deals with independent chains who don't have probably the ability the way AMC does to say no to this. So we passed offered a deal that was too good to be true, and now they're walking in like Don Corleone going like, hey, uh, yep. that's some nice new business you got here. It'd be a shame yeah. if something <laughs> happened to it, you know? Some I'm just point. saying. Uh, I still cannot decide if they are the smartest company or the stupidest company in the world. I really cannot figure it out. Still, though, Mitch Lowe was great at selling MoviePass, and I think that's one of the reasons publicly why people had faith in it and said, well, you know, I guess that this could really work because he just had a way of framing things so nicely and so confidently that you said, well, okay, I guess that he knows what he's talking about. Roth and I walked out of there like, no, this is this is real. He like he got us for sure. I could totally see how he could walk into a boardroom, convince you know, total emperor's new clothes scenario, and then walk out with millions of dollars and have nothing. Every single Mitch Lowe interview would go something like this. So your business is unprofitable. Yes. And the bigger movie pass gets, the more money it's gonna lose. Yes, that's right. And your road to profitability is largely contingent on theaters cutting you in on their profits. Absolutely, yes, 100%. But the biggest theater chain in the US has said that they definitely won't be doing that. That is correct. And despite this, your plan is to keep growing recklessly without changing your prices and still offering this money losing deal. You got it, 100%. And you actually think this is gonna work? Absolutely I do. And if you understood our business plan, you would too. Over time, it was enough to convince you that you were the crazy one. And I remember being driven to a point of insanity when I realized as I started having issues with MoviePass's business model that it would actually hurt the company more if I stayed as a customer. I'm gonna cancel MoviePass. But at the same time, they that's good for them because I use it a lot. So really, I'm torn. Do I cancel MoviePass because <laughs> I don't like the way that they do business? Or do I use it way more because the more that I use it, the more I screw them because they don't want users like me. And the more I use it, the more I cost them money. Their business model is the most insane. It's insane. I, it it's benefits like they them for in... me to stop using it. Yeah, like their business <laughs> what model. Is that? It makes me feel like I'm going crazy. Like it makes me feel like I am in a Kafka maze of insanity. I just cannot figure out why they just want to keep spending more money and not making any. It hurts me. And I want to be clear about something. I cost MoviePass a lot of money. I actually tried to go back and calculate it. I was a MoviePass member from October of 2017 when I saw Flatliners. That was the first movie I used my MoviePass to go see, and I absolutely would not have gone to see that movie otherwise. And I used my MoviePass for less than a year through June of 2018, following the last movie I used it for, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But over that stretch of time, I saw a minimum of 36 movies. Thank you, Letterboxd, for helping me log my movie watching history. At an average charge of $13 per ticket in LA, and sometimes it was more, that means that I charged $468 worth of movie tickets to my MoviePass card, which I paid $90 in subscription fees for over that same period of time. So I alone cost the company at least $378, and really that's times two because I went with Mara. So the two of us cost MoviePass over $750 just between us, and this is a company that was doing this at a scale of over 3 
million subscribers at its peak. Unsurprisingly, as the cash was just on fire, MoviePass then began to change their terms seemingly at random. And as a member first and then an observer, that was its own little bit of craziness just to watch. First, they added peak or surge pricing to some titles, charging as much as two or six dollars extra per ticket, depending on what movie you were seeing or what time of day you were seeing the movie. Then they said they were going to raise their prices and then they backtracked and said they weren't going to raise their prices. And then they said, well, if for people at a certain level, you can only see X many movies a month, but then they kind of backtracked on that too. At one point, they instituted a ticket verification system where you had to send in a picture of your ticket stub to prove that you were going to the movie that you said that you were going to, which added a whole new level of complication to it. Sometimes during heavy usage, people's accounts would be canceled for no reason. They'd say that it was fraudulent when they hadn't been doing anything fraudulent. People's passwords would be changed randomly. You never knew from day to day what new insanity the MoviePass was going to launch upon its user base. Things were obviously going terribly for MoviePass. They didn't have any money, and yet their only strategy throughout this was not only to keep expanding its user base, but to keep branching out into new avenues and new areas that cost even more money. One of those new areas was to get into the distribution business. And their plan was, okay, as MoviePass, we'll get behind these movies and we'll push our subscribers through their apps and everything to go see them. And what will eventually happen is that studios will pay us to do this for certain movies. Now, of course, the studios never did, and all it did was cost MoviePass even more money, but that's just the way that they did business. And this new practice of partnering with specific movies to come on as producers and distributors and push the movies out to the user base led directly to what has now become known as the Gotti incident. I don't want to bore anyone that might already know, but briefly for those that don't know, Gotti was a John Travolta movie directed by Kevin Connolly, AKA E from Entourage, about the life of John Gotti. Let me tell you something. New York is the greatest city in the world. My city. This was a passion project for John Travolta. At one point, it looked like it wasn't even going to go to theaters, but MoviePass swept in and said, no, we're going to make this our biggest platform release ever. We're going to push the movie, advertise the movie, tell our users to go see it, even though, keep in mind, every time they encouraged someone to go see Gotti, it would cost them money. But, I mean, that was just par for the course at that point. Supposedly about 40% of its business this weekend came from MoviePass, which yeah. is weird because they bought the movie and then they themselves saw subsidized people going to see it, right. which means so they the pay business, for it twice. Yeah, the business model was basically pay for it two times. It just, anyway, uh, that's, that's a whole other video that anyway. we'll do later. And when Gotti came out, it debuted to a 0% score on Rotten Tomatoes. Not one critic gave it a good review, and it was also a bomb at the box office. But as the user ratings came in on Rotten Tomatoes following the movie's release, something began to look a little off because Gotti, a movie that opened outside the top 10 and wasn't even in wide release, was attracting the same number of user reviews and ratings as movies that were massive box office hits like Incredibles 2. How is it that a movie that opened on almost 10 times as many screens and did, you know, 100 times the box office of Gotti has almost the exact same number of user ratings. Who are these Who audience it? members Who running it? the numbers on Gotti, and why did more people, almost as many people, run to rate Gotti as Is there a really big John to? Travolta fan base out there that we're just not aware of? I don't know. You tell hmm. us. I remember hearing these rumors and looking at the user reviews for Gotti, and most of the accounts, especially the ones that gave it five stars, had been registered right at the time that Gotti came out, and the accounts had also either reviewed one movie, which was Gotti, or some of them had only reviewed two movies. One of them was Gotti, and the other one was a much better movie called American Animals, which came out around the same time as Gotti, and was also one of the movies that was picked up for distribution by, you guessed it, Movie Pass. We co-invested in American Animal. Uh, it's gonna be released by Orchard in June. And, you know, we'll buy selectively films and then promote them. As with MoviePass's business strategy, it soon became very clear that something just wasn't right about this. Why would they even do this? But it all really came into focus literally the day that I reported on this first on what was then charting with Dan when they unleashed a new marketing campaign for Gotti that specifically used the artificially boosted audience score to combat the film's negative critical reviews. You fight till you can't fight no more. Never back off, ever. Die, 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 die. 
So this pissed me off because even if the audience reviews had been legitimate, it's just a scummy strategy. I hate this thing of trying to sow division between audiences and critics. So I talked about it on air and I posted about it on Twitter and it got a little bit of traction. Wow, here's the head of marketing for Gotti touting high audience numbers as the reason that the critics don't make sense. It's like, so it's obvious that their strategy is to artificially manipulate the audience numbers. And then, and then yesterday they put this out and it's just like, like you couldn't, you couldn't, it's so <laughs> pathetic. Eventually Rotten Tomatoes said that they had no indication that the score had been influenced by bots and that the profiles had been made by actual people, which I never disputed. I never said it was bots. I said that people were signing up for fake accounts, but based on Rotten Tomatoes statement, to my complete amazement, the gaudy movie logged on to Twitter and responded to me personally demanding an apology. I don't know if you guys caught the um, Twitter exchange between the... Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow, look at that tweet storm. Between uh, Dan Merle, our own Dan Merle, and the Gotti Film Twitter account, which I'm sorry, they were so rude. Um, I didn't start this war. No, they started it. They started this war. I did see now they're saying like, it's really suspicious how, how quickly the audience score is dropping on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm like, yeah. oh, Cause real so when it drops, wanted. it's being manipulated. But when it's high, mm. it's totally legit. Of all the surreal turns that the movie pass saga took, this was obviously the most surreal. A Twitter feud with a terrible John Travolta movie is not something that I would have thought even two or three weeks earlier was a possibility. I, I don't know what anybody involved was thinking, and yet there it was. And you know, listen, it was a good thing for me personally. It, like I said, it got a lot of traction. It got me on the Today Show for a few seconds. I drove to their studio uh, at NBC Universal and sat down for an interview to talk about it. Like it was absolute craziness. But for Movie Pass, this was just another day at the office. If you're gonna do the top five craziest things that MoviePass ever did, this may not even make the top five. MoviePass was the embodiment of that meme where the room is on fire and the dog is just sitting in the middle of the room saying, this is fine. The Gotti incident, along with the escalating changes in the terms of service and the fact that I just didn't like the way that they were doing business, caused me to cancel my movie pass in June of 2018 after I used it to go see Gotti and cost him a few more bucks. I don't know what you want. I don't know how your business works. I don't think you'll ever make money. And um, see you in bankruptcy court. And it also coincided with the launch of AMC A-List, which is still around because it's a movie subscription service that's actually, you know, sustainable. And by this point, MoviePass was dying the slowest, most agonizing, and yet most predictable death that you could imagine. Unless they prove to somebody in the next two months that, that this too good to be true deal, which was always too good to be true yeah. and remains too good to be true, that they can somehow turn this into a viable business model, they will have to either, one, go out of business, uh, two, raise their price significantly, uh, or three, keep their price the same and offer fewer movies. I never trusted it. I didn't trust it because it was it was like that suitcase full of money on the street scam. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, hey, hey, you! I found a suitcase. Well, and, and they money. took all the risk. That's the mm. thing. This it was the three card money suitcase on the street scam. Yeah. Except it's like if you played three card money and they gave you the twenty dollar your twenty dollars yeah, ahead of time, and they're like, you get to keep this no matter if you find it or not. It's like it, it, it was a deal that's too good to be true. But they took all the risk. Scam. There was the weekend in July 2018 when Mission Impossible Fallout came out and the service mysteriously stopped working. But of of course they denied the obvious reality, which is that they didn't have enough money to cover all the tickets that were being sold and said that, oh, you know what? It's a technical glitch. What are you talking about? It works fine. And people are like, no, it doesn't. They're like, oh, it, it, there's a, it's a thing with the computers. They're like, I think you're out of money. They're like, no, we're not. It's, there's a thing. And by fall of 2018, MoviePass began restricting usage, especially in big cities, to such an extent that it was essentially useless for any movie that was actually in wide release. Would you like to know the wide release movies that you can go see uh, this entire weekend if you're a MoviePass subscriber? I'm just gonna go, it just is still Venom. It's still, <laughs> like it's only, only Venom. Venom. It's, they just keep trying to find a new way to trick you into Venom. It's not even Venom. There is no movie in wide release that you can go see this weekend if you're a MoviePass subscriber, <laughs> which means you cannot get a pass into any movie as a MoviePass subscriber. <laughs> but even as they were circling the drain, 
MoviePass still didn't give up, which led to my favorite chapter in this story. By far the funniest, and what I think was the most egregious omission from the new MoviePass documentary, just because of the utter craziness of it. And I'm talking, of course, about the emergence of Chloe, the director of marketing. I told, I, I forwarded this to Billy yesterday. Oh, this is the greatest part. And the, the, the email just said, I'll stop forwarding you these stories when they stop being Fucking effing crazy. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this was a real email that was sent to MoviePass users in November of 2018, along with a picture of Chloe, the director of marketing. Quote, woof. I'm Chloe, the director of marketing at MoviePass. I'd like to explain why, from time to time, you may have had a rough experience with us, but it turns out that I'm a dog and I can't talk. What I do know is that I see these humans working like crazy to make MoviePass better and better for you as fast as possible. They are so grateful for your membership and support while they work it out. We're listening, we're learning, we're changing. I don't know what it's like to actually live in the Matrix, but this whole email thing from Chloe, the director of marketing, made me feel like I was living in a simulation. The unreality of it all was almost too much to bear. It was the ultimate page in the movie pass playbook, which was to say the craziest thing you could imagine and act like it was perfectly normal. What are what you is doing? <laughs> <laughs> I can't understand you. I'm a dog. Why are you reading this? This is crazy. <laughs> what what world doing? are we living in? <laughs> oh my God. Sorry, you've had a rough experience. <laughs> you guys can't make me believe that I am not asleep. <laughs> that I have not been asleep for a very Director long time. Marketing. You <laughs> cannot convince me that this is not some crazy fever dream. MoviePass was functionally dead by the fall of 2018. It bled out slowly until it officially went out of business in the fall of 2019. But even the death of MoviePass was difficult to process because as wrong as they were about so many things, they were also right about the fact that the movie industry could support a subscription service, that it was something that people were interested in. And it's something that's now been normalized here in the US after being popular in a lot of places internationally for many years. It was a disruptor. Yeah. yeah. They set Definitely. out to do what they meant what they meant to do. They just didn't it, they did it in the most spectacularly not way that they anticipated mm -hmm. by completely running their company into the ground and making their arch nemesis AMC stronger. Mm -hmm. They came up with a deal that was too good to be true. If it hadn't cost a lot of people a lot of money and jobs, um, I would say uh, it's almost <laughs> admirable, but I can't go that far. Plus the lying, really. Rest in peace, movie pass. Rest it's, in uh, peace. It was certainly provided Cheers. us a lot Cheers. of uh, a lot of airtime. Looking back on all of this, first of all, it, it made me realize just how much I enjoyed getting together with my friends and talking about movie news every morning. It was a grind sometimes, but it was usually just a great way to laugh and talk about the day, and especially when you had a story like Movie Pass, which was just so nuts to have people to share that with. I really hate how that whole side of the movie news industry, the groups of people that would get together and talk about movies, was largely dismantled by companies that either didn't care about or didn't appreciate just how important it is to have that community aspect. You don't have a lot of those groups of people that get around and talk about news like that anymore. But it also brought me back to just how singular this story was. I don't think we'll ever see anything like this in the movie space again, but MoviePass was one of the first of many stories that we saw across all different kinds of industries where a company was built on complete fiction and was able to generate all of this investment without having any idea of how they would ever make a profit. And then the company just flames out spectacularly. I really think that MoviePass could only have existed at this specific moment in time because of the way that private equity was working and the way that people were building these companies based on tech and apps. We were at the beginning of the new streaming revolution, which used a lot of the same ways as far as future projections of income and a lot of the same methods that MoviePass did. Mitch Lowe, as wrong at best as he was about so many things, was also right about the theatrical exhibition industry. He was right about declining attendance. He was right about the big blockbusters being the only movies that are actually able to draw an audience and so many other things being driven to watching at home and how he wanted to preserve that theatrical experience. Whether it was BS or not, 
He was right about that. The cost of going to a movie has gotten so out of hand, people are saying, I'm just going to wait and watch it on Netflix. Mm -hmm. So they still go to see Star Wars. They see the big Marvel hits. You may be a Wes Anderson fan, so you'll go see all of his films. But you won't see, you'll, you'll, you'll see I, Tanya or Lady Bird and you'll say, you know, I'll just wait and, and see it, you know, when it's on Netflix or HBO or Hulu or one of those services. And I guess for all of those reasons, my biggest disappointment with MoviePass Movie Crash was that it treated MoviePass as just another modern tech story. And MoviePass was not just a modern tech story. It was a wild, insane ride. From beginning to end, it was surreal almost on a daily basis. And for me, that was the most appealing thing. That's the reason that I've got my movie pass card framed and up there on the shelf in every video that I do. It's a reminder to me of this year to year and a half long stretch where almost every day I would look at this and go either, how is this going to work? Or how do they keep doing this? Or what the hell are they thinking? I just don't think that we'll ever see anything quite like it again. And that's the thing I don't think the documentary was able to capture, and I wish that it had. It, it touches on a few of these things, but it really largely ignores how crazy it was to watch this from month to month and from day to day sometimes. Just the fact that this was a completely insane idea that everybody treated as if it was the next big thing, and yet that failed somehow more spectacularly than I thought that it was going to. It was a wild, drama-filled ride that was, in a weird way, a lot of fun to watch and cover at the time and was a lot of fun to go back and watch for this video. And it's that feel that I think you're missing from the Movie Pass documentary. So I decided to make, you know, a little bit of my own mini retrospective and mini documentary. And if you were around when Movie Pass was around, then hopefully you also got to relive just a little bit of one of the craziest news stories that I think I'll ever be able to cover. I've never gotten into a feud with a John Travolta movie before. Wild Hogs, you're next. <laughs> so those are my thoughts and memories on the birth and death of MoviePass. What do you think? Are there some favorite MoviePass memories that you want to share? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thanks so much. If you're going to be in New York on June 21st, be sure to check the description below for links to buy tickets for a live event that I am doing alongside my good buddy Christian Harloff. We're going to be appearing at a venue called The Green Room 42. You can get that link down in the description to buy those tickets. We're going to be talking about things like Movie Pass and other movie news stories and taking audience questions, and we love to see you there. And also be sure to stay tuned right here on the channel for more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.